Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul O'Kane. Uh, I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament and the Deputy Convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. And I would like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021, in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. Uh, this afternoon's panel uh, is entitled uh, Cut Your Food's Carbon Footprint and is being held in partnership with the Rowett Institute the University of Aberdeen, and we are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today. Uh, and I do look forward uh, to hearing comment, discussion, and questions uh, as we go through this afternoon, uh, focusing on, of course, a very important and relevant topic. And I'm sure everyone else is looking forward to seeing questions and comments. This is a, a time where I think it's critical to ask questions about where food comes from. Uh, and the production process is involved before it lands on our plates. How will climate change affect our weekly shop? And what practical changes can we make to minimise our carbon footprint, from rethinking food miles to innovative urban farming, or embracing new forms of bug foods? The panel uh, aims today to try and address all of those questions within the next 60 minutes. Um, so do stay with us. Um, as I've said already, I would encourage you all to take part. Um, today is very much about an interactive experience, uh, so please do use the event chat function to introduce yourself, stating your name and your geographical location, uh, and any questions that you would like to pose uh, for the panel to respond to. So that brings me to our panel, and I'm delighted to be joined by four panelists today. Uh, professor Estera Bridal is Professor of Food, Climate and Society at the University of York and author of the book Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air. Professor Jenny McDermott is Professor of Sustainable Nutrition and Health at the University of Aberdeen and Director of uh, the Centre for Interdisciplinary Challenges in Health, Nutrition and Wellbeing. Uh, Abby Morden is co-founder of the Glasgow Food Policy Partnership. And Pete Ritchie is a director of Nourish Scotland. So a very warm welcome to all of our panelists today, who are all very busy people, but have kindly agreed to join uh, and help lead our conversation. So as I said, there will be an opportunity for the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event, and um, I'll be keeping an eye on those and, and bringing those in as we go along. So as I said already. Uh, if you want to, to put your comment or question, uh, then please use the chat box. We will try and get through as many as possible, because I know people are keen to contribute. However, I think what we will do just to start is to ask each of our panellists to perhaps comment uh, on those predictions that we have cited in the, uh, the report from Oxfam, uh, that most people will actually start to directly experience climate change um, through the impact on their food, indeed, what do they eat, the price that they have to pay, and indeed the availability. So I think if we can have some initial thoughts um, from each of our panelists on that, and I'm going to come uh, first to Professor Sarah Bridal, then to Professor Jenny McDermott, then Abby, uh, and followed by Pete. So we'll start with uh, Professor Sarah Bridal. Hi there. Yeah. So I think this is really important to get across the, you know, the a lot of people won't necessarily feel that climate change is going to be something very tangible to them. But then I think over the last year we've we've all become much more aware of of the fragility of our food system, um, and how it can actually be affected by by events, including in the future extreme weather. And and so I really, you know, I think this is really helpful to you know emphasise the, the the fact that food is going to be affected. It could be by extreme weather events in this country, but it could also be, be by extreme weather events in other countries that impact what we can access. But also, um, there could be changes in how much people are prepared to export, and we've seen that happen before. For example, in 2008, food protectionism, which could also affect what we can get hold of. So I think this is, you know, a really tangible thing that is emphasising the importance of climate change, and I really welcome, um, you know, the, the highlighting um, these topics from Oxfam. Thank you very much. Um, we'll come to uh, Professor uh, McDermott next. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I well agreeing with what Sarah has just said, and adding to that is probably the cost of, of the cost of food. Um, as uh, the systems change, 
sort of with the dealing with climate change, what impact that's going to have on our food system and production of food, um, food prices are going to, I think, probably increase. And the concern there is the inequality that that might create in terms of who can afford to eat it and who can't. So um, I think what we're paying for food is going to change. Um, and also, and that's partly availability, access to food, um, and what can actually be produced um, with the climate changing, because what we can actually produce will also um, change, not just with extreme weather events, but as um, climates get warmer, get colder, sort of more um, flooding, more drought, uh, that's going to affect what we can actually produce as well. Um, and I think this is going to have serious implications for changing what we eat to mitigate climate change as well as to adapt to it. Thank you. Come now to Abby. Yeah, so um, from my perspective, I think, um, you know, we, the, the many people in countries um, in the global south have been experiencing um, you know, challenges to their food, food supplies through um, disruptions to the climate system for a very long time. And um, we're, we're just starting to experience that here. Uh, a huge amount of what we produce in Scotland um, is not actually what we eat in Scotland, particularly. Um, we are quite reliant on imports from countries with quite fragile climates, for example, rice uh, from the global south um, and uh, vegetables, um, largely speaking, from uh, Spain and Italy. Um, so those countries are much more on the front line, I suppose, of, you might say, of climate change than we are. And, and so the availability of, uh, of, of the pro produce and food that we're used to eating uh, is going to become a lot scarcer uh, unless we start paying attention to what we produce in Scotland and, and how we produce it. Uh, and just to echo Jenny's comments there on um, availability and, and, and uh, the price, the price points of these products as well, will we'll definitely, as, as um, you know, the basic economics, supply and demand, um, the, the more scarce a resource is, the more expensive it becomes. So. Thank you for, for that initial insight. And we'll come to Pete by now. Uh, thanks, Paul. It wouldn't be much of a debate if we all just said the same thing. So I'm going to say exactly the opposite. The cost of transport okay. has fallen dramatically in the last century. The cost of food has fallen dramatically in the last century. Our problem isn't too little food. Our problem is too much food that we can produce in the world. We have a capacity to produce far more food than we need. And the reason people go hungry is because they don't have any money. So I don't think we can rely on sort of the threats of climate change to influence our, to, to drive our decisions about food policy. We need to have a more sustainable food system. We need to limit red meat consumption high. Well, and white meat consumption, that part, we could go on about that, and farm fish consumption in our high-consuming countries, because it's a grossly inefficient use of resources, and we need to sort of um, level up in terms of our impact on biodiversity and climate in the way we eat. And as other speakers have said, we need to make sure that people on low incomes can eat as good a diet as people on high incomes. But that's a matter of social policy. We certainly can't rely on, you know, droughts and pestilence to, to change our food choices. We have to rely on some choice editing, and it's interesting that Compass are already taking air freighted food off their menus. You know, so some of the big retailers and caterers will do some of that choice editing for us, which they wouldn't have done ten years ago. And then we have to look at some of the fiscal measures in terms of things like carbon pricing to actually re-internalise the externalities in our food system, and that's something that has to happen through probably certainly at EU level, um, actually trying to change the market. So that the market failure that we have at the moment, our food system is reversed. At the moment, all those things, the degrading of our natural ecosystems, the driving of climate change, you know, the exploitation of workers, those aren't reflected. And the poor health that some of our food produces, those aren't reflected in the price of food. And it's getting the price right that we need to do. And that's a policy issue, not, not primarily a, a sort of natural um, process. You know, we can't rely on natural processes. We have to take charge of the policy. Thank you very much. Um, well, can I thank our panellists for those uh, setting the scene almost uh, for our conversation? And I think absolutely uh, dissent and debate are always uh, welcome in these uh, these uh, discussions because I think actually it informs perhaps our thinking uh, more richly. Um, someone uh, I think in, in the chat has asked for the, uh, the Oxfam report link that has now been posted up um, so people are able to 
to digest that uh, as we go through uh, and indeed uh, after the event as well, um, a very detailed piece of work. So just to remind everyone uh, to get your questions in, but I'm going to perhaps kick off uh, and ask some um, questions to our panellists, uh, just perhaps based on, on their comments so far. So I think I'll come to uh, Jenny McDermott first. Um, Jenny, how do you think we can encourage or indeed support people to make better carbon choices, perhaps, um, when it comes to, to food? You know, do we have to look at issues around um, labelling, or is it perhaps something more, more fundamental than that, do you think? Um, well, I think we need to look at multiple uh, aspects of this. Uh, labelling is important, but we know from a nutrition perspective that labelling isn't sufficient to change what people are doing. Those who are concerned about it, it provides them with helpful information, but it doesn't get people um, in the mainstream the population to change their diet. So I think we need to look at availability to alternatives. Um, we need to look at actually the whole food chain. So what can be done? in terms of what's happening in the terms of production of food, the supply of food that reaches the consumer, because I don't think that we should leave any one sector to solve this problem. It's got to be done, you know, provide consumers with the choice. Um, and if that's sort of more sort of uh, low carbon alternatives, so maybe less meat, then I think we need to look at that. But also I think we need to look at People's lifestyles as well. I think this is something we forget quite a lot in terms of trying to change behaviours, is how do we get it to fit into a certain lifestyle, what people desire, etc. I mean, it's interesting at the moment, we're seeing more and more convenience food that are plant-based. Um, and uh, this, this talks to people's um, issues around, we need to have um, something that's convenient. I don't want to spend time cooking. I don't know what to cook. I just want something easy. Um, and I think that's one way, but uh, I come also from a nutrition perspective, and my concern there is the two aren't running in parallel at the moment. So a lot of the convenience foods that are coming out aren't necessarily healthy, um, so or the plant-based ones aren't necessarily healthy. So I think we need to make sure those still run in parallel, that we don't forget one or the other. Um, but I think we do need to encourage people. We need to look at ways that we can make alternatives attractive because one of the barriers are people say, I enjoy eating meat, um, I don't want to give it up. The alternative wouldn't be tasty. So I think we need to do multiple things across the whole food system that doesn't just rely on sort of uh, the consumer having to make all the changes. It's got to be something that's done across the whole food system. Thank you. And, and I think that that's um, very true. I mean, I think we have seen a substantial kind of growth in plant-based burgers, I think, being the kind of thing, and, and those meat alternatives. And I think, uh, Jenny, you're right, we see those often in, in perhaps a fast food environment now, is, and, and a really kind of big marketing push on those. Um, but equally, I mean, some restaurants, for example, the Grub Kitchen in England, which is attached to a bug farm, I think is trying to make more of a, a process around that, um, of kind of understanding how, how we get to to that um, product being available. So I don't know if, um, if Sarah, do you have any thoughts on this at all um, from that kind of point of view? Yeah, and I think that um, what we find uh, when we talk to people about this topic is that there are a lot of people who are already trying to um, eat, choose foods in an environmentally sustainable way who don't necessarily have access to the right information, for example, might think that they're solving climate change by reducing their plastic use is, is a very common misconception that we, we run into. So while I um, take on board totally Jenny's point and I agree with Jenny's point that you know, the research shows that giving people more information doesn't change what they eat. But at the same time, actually, I believe that the research also shows that if you give people more information, for example, on sugar causing obesity, it does change people's um, receptiveness to changes in policy. What we saw yesterday coming out, um, there was a, you know, a bit of a kerfuffle with a document appearing on a government website, which then was removed again or, or clarified in terms of what the government meant about, um, about its uh, potential to put climate taxes on food. Um, that this is you know, something which is really politically toxic and very difficult for politicians to, to say, come out saying, I'm going to do a new um, policy on, on, on the climate impact of food, for example, labelling or even taxation. But we kind of have to have that as a first step, I think. Otherwise, we're kind of all talking um, you know, across purposes, potentially, about the size of the impact of different types of food. 
Thank you. I think you know Pete, you spoke quite. Uh, it was quite interesting to hear you talk about choice there and about perhaps some people feeling that their choices are often limited, so they want to make the right decision, but there has to be a, a variety of, of ways to make that happen. And I think something we've seen is that quite a lot of people want to um, make choices um, within their weekly shop, even uh, about how they're purchasing, if you like. And but, but sometimes they feel constrained by the fact that they may live in a tenemental property. Are flat, and I think over the course of COVID, we've seen a lot of this to do with physical and mental well-being of not having a garden space, not having access to a place where where you can be uh, outdoors. And I, and I think for a lot of people who might want to kind of grow their own, there's not always that option. And we know the challenges there are around allotment provision and things like that. So, do, do you think there are alternatives? I mean, do we need to look at our more urban farming? Do we need to think about the spaces that are available in, in cities, Pete, and, and things like that? Wow, that's a very different question, but absolutely, we need to grow urban farming in Scotland. We've got so much land in our city, so much derelict and vacant land from the Industrial Revolution and brownfield sites. You know, we've got potential to put, you know, controlled environment glasshouses on that, grow all our own med veg and stop having to bring them in, relying on a lot of, you know, water from very arid parts of Spain, but also slave labour, to be honest, you know, in a lot of our food. So we can create good all year round jobs, you know, growing those tomatoes and aubergines that we do prefer to turnips, you know, I know we should eat turnips and but we actually prefer the other tastier stuff. So let's grow it in Scotland. I think it's a really good idea. And let's welcome it. I'm Abby to say more about urban farming because that's her, her, her thing, but it's a fantastic, you know, it delivers on so many things. It's not just food production, it's everything else, but let Abby say more about that. Um, I just want to come back, you know, we haven't mentioned food waste, but obviously that went down during the pandemic because it was such a drag going to shops and we sort of looked at what's in our fridge first um, and it's gone back up again. But, you know, that's the obvious thing, you know, that. We need to support people and create a food environment where it's easier not to waste food. Um, but just to say, in terms of your weekly shop, there is an information overload for people. And there's a nice wee browser that's been developed at the University of Glasgow, which you just, it's a plug in to your Tesco shop, or your Sainsbury shop, or whatever. And it'll give you real time feedback on the carbon footprint drawing on some of the databases that people like Jenny have developed. You know, so it'll actually tell you how you're doing, you know, and it, you don't have to read the labels, it does that for you. And I think things like that can help if people want, because a lot of people do want to sort of, you know, be more aware of their, their, their footprint. And if things like that work and in tests, that's reduced people's footprint by about 14, 15 percent. You know, it's the sort of thing where actually the supermarkets could all agree to, to provide that sort of information to people. Mm -hmm. You know, already caterers are putting carbon labeling on their menus. You know, so we will see more useful information coming forward to help people, you know, make those choices. But I'll hand over to Abby on the urban food stuff. Great, yeah, Abby, tell us about, about urban farming. I do want to come to you on some of the global issues as well, but but go for it. Yeah, sure thing. So, obviously, um, I, I've been working in, in and around Glasgow for the last 15 years, um, mostly around community foods, and I, I think food education ha has a huge part to play in all these all these topics that we're talking about, um, both at a community level. Uh, but really, you know, trying to get um, really good all-round food systems education into into schools from a very, very, very early age, so that people have a very kind of thorough understanding, really, of kind of you know how our food is produced, um, but not just the the sort of the carbon impacts on that, but the impacts on nature, biodiversity, and so forth. And a, an excellent physical manifestation of that um, is through is sort of urban farming. Um, Glasgow is great. Um, it's got three uh, market garden collectives um, operating in with the, in, in, the, in the, around the city. So the Wash House Garden in Parkhead, um, Tenement Veg, who have got a couple of different sites. Um, yeah, and uh, and uh, Locavore, of course, who kind of currently occupy the Bella Houston site. Um, the Bella Houston site is an ex-council nursery site, so massive greenhouses, lots of polytunnels, um, as well as an outdoor space. Um, the Wash House Garden is a, a very small social enterprise, and they, they provide a, a quite an affordable box scheme to people within the east end of the city, and, and a, have a, an excellent, really excellent uh, kind of volunteering and on-site education program. Um, so, yeah, as, as Pete said, you know, low, so much vacancy derelict land, um, some of it green space, some of it controversially under maintained or disused golf courses that the city council are currently 
um, relinquishing out of their control. Um, and so there's a huge opportunities to develop urban agriculture on quite a large scale um, within the city boundaries itself, uh, as well as kind of looking into sort of, you know, the, the peri-urban kind of environment as well. Um, another really good site, uh, Glasgow specific again, is the um, the Dal Dawi site, another kind of ex-training centre of the Glasgow City Council for Horticulture. Uh, and that sits between a sewage works and a crematorium. So, you know, from a kind of um, heat capture kind of perspective for heating and lighting greenhouses and uh, and kind of in increasing the, the kind of the, gro the growing season, then we can get those peppers and aubergines and tomatoes of really quite quality in a scale that that, um, that Pete's talking about. Um, in addition. Oh, I think we have lost Abby, unfortunately. Hi. Abby, sorry, you dropped out there uh, for a minute. You were just about to start your next point, and then we lost you. So if you want to just start that. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, there's quite a few projects pop popping up that are doing um, indoor vertical farming. Uh, so uh, Glasgow Greens, um, another really good example of this. They've just taken on 11,000 square feet, I think it is, uh, under what was the Arches nightclub on Argyle Street. Um, and they're doing uh, kind of, they started off with microgreens, but they're now growing kind of, you know, full size vegetables. Um, and again, loads of food education kind of caught up and bound up with that as well. And they, they've got this kind of aspirations to supply uh, fresh green produce to um, to all the schools in Glasgow. So really tapping into that procurement side of things as well, which is a total game changer and definitely on a not just an urban context, but in a kind of rural context as well. So, yeah, I think in a nutshell, urban farming, both indoor and outdoor, can um, can provide a, a kind of multitude of opportunities around training, skills development, uh, food education, but of course, food production and supply uh, to, the, to the, in, the inhabitants of the cities. Thanks for that. I mean, I think that's that's a great insight. I, I have also seen some great examples um, that work on a kind of larger level and a smaller level. Uh, uh, in my region, I was down in Greenock, uh, uh, a number of the community garden and projects there that are growing their own food. One of them in Belleville is actually on the site of uh, former high flats that were, were kind of taken down a, a number of years ago. And actually, that whole area has been reclaimed and is being put to put to really productive use. And similarly, in the village where I live, we have an incredible edible project, uh, which is quite small scale, but again allows uh, families and and people. Just my dad was telling me the other day, popped along and uh, borrowed a courgette. Essentially, didn't borrow it because he didn't give it back. <laughs> I think it went into soup. But um, you know, there are these opportunities. I think and people are far more switched on to that. It's just how do we upscale and and support communities to do more of that? I think. Um, we're getting a couple of comments in now, I think, just to, to pepper the discussion, if you like. Um, something about, uh, I think, farmland being made, making sure that we use farmland well and that um, there is a, a rush to grow trees, to plant uh, woodland upon uh, you know, farms that aren't in use anymore. And I think a concern that that then uh, doesn't allow us to have as productive farmland. Indeed, oh. I, I visited a farm. Um, the other week there, and they were discussing that, and and, and perhaps some of the carbon offsetting that goes on by big companies, you know, companies who you know buy a farm uh, and then plant it up. So, does anyone have a perspective on that they want to share, perhaps, or you can just wave at me? Yeah, Sarah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that this often comes up. You know, we want to want to use nature to help to reduce climate change, um, and I just want to put that alternative view out there, which is that. Actually, if we look at the use of farmland, about 80% of land globally is used to feed animals, um, which then, you know, and that uses um, relatively more farmland, over 10 times as much land is needed per calorie of animal food than it is of plant food. So I'm not saying that we need to stop eating animals, but we actually do have, a, you know, there's, a, there's a huge amount of land there to play with in terms of, um, you know, reducing the amount of land we use to produce food, if we're going to also reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that will inevitably lead us to reduce the amount of animals we're eating, so that then that could free up land to help reduce climate change. And I'm going to bring Pete in as well on this. Yeah, I mean, just just to say not all animals are equal, and, you know, we spend, most of the meat we eat, let's be clear, is monogastrics, it's chickens and pigs, and we're feeding them on high quality protein and high quality calories which humans could eat. We're also feeding a lot of our farmed fish on a high quality protein that humans do eat. You know? And so there's a real question with ruminants, as we know, 
generally, not in feedlots, but in most of Scotland, eat grass we can't eat. And they convert human inedible protein into human edible protein, and they don't use a lot of calories in the process, right? So, and they don't use a lot of water in the process, unlike feedlot beef. So we do have to say not all animals are equal. I think we're really clear that, you know, we need to moderate our meat consumption and we need to make our farms much more diverse, particularly our grassland farms, need a lot more trees on them, they need more diversity of species, and they need a lot less nitrogen on them. You know, but I think trading, you know, a diverse grassland for a Sitka spruce plantation to make some money for a hedge fund is not a good use of public money. And at the moment we're putting public money into making that happen. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, so I've got everyone's hands out, which is great. Uh, but I'm going to just kind of, I think, I think the discussion and where we're headed in this at the moment is essentially that tension perhaps between helping farmers to uh, transition to more sustainable uh, farming. You, you know, are the two aims, you know, of essentially, because food demand is going to increase, we know that, um, particularly, you know, 35% by, by 2030. So are those two aims mutually exclusive? You know, can we can we do both? But I, I know people want to comment on what they've heard as well. So I'll maybe start with Abby, uh, then go to Jenny, and then come to Sarah. Yeah, um, I just sort of picking up on the the sort of exchanging farmland for forestry uh, kind of perspective. Um, so I, I relocated um, in April 2020 down to Dumfries and Galloway, out of Glasgow, uh, to start running a market garden down here. Um, and I'm in one of the areas of Dumfries and Galloway that uh, is, um, it's kind of, we've got Sitka spruce plantations popping up all over the place, as well as wind turbines and wind farms. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge issue facing farmers who have, who have been kind of, you know, eking out a living in the uplands for such a long time, uh, raising, as, as Pete has said, you know, for the majority of that time, uh, grass fed, pasture fed, um, cattle and, uh, and sheep, um, who, you know, can actually uh, bring huge benefits to to sort of car to carbon sequestration and uh, nature and biodiversity if they're managed in the right kind of way. Um, cattle, particularly on a sort of sort of low density livestock kind of ratios, uh, can be really good for sort of um, diverse and mixed grasslands. Um, and trees, the right kind of trees, the right trees in the right place, can provide a huge amount of benefits to livestock as well. Um, through um, through shelter, through uh, uh, sort of um, nutrition, lots of plants, exactly, for example, willow, you know, contain nutrients, beneficial nutrients, and sort of medicinal qualities for cattle and other livestock. Um, yeah, so mixing mixing those two together can be can, can have huge benefits. Planting hedgerows, for example, uh, can have huge benefits. Um, and just to, to sort of follow on for the, your, your next question, my my, um, my current work down here is is kind of working quite a lot with farmers in, in this region. Which is primarily beef and dairy and um, and lamb, um, and uh, we we've been kind of working on this project for the last year called the Fork to Farm Dialogues. It's uh, part of Nourish's work in the run up to COP26, and I've been organising uh, groups of uh, farmers and food producers to meet with local authority policy officers to talk about agriculture and climate change and what we can what we can do collectively to challenge to sort of you know respond to some of these challenges that are facing us. Um, and I think some of the the, out, the outcomes from that is really that we're going to set up a, a kind of nature friendly farmers network for this area going forward into 2022, because one of the best ways to encourage farmers to transition to sustainable farming uh, is to um, is through peer to peer learning and support. Um, and uh, to, for, for farmers that have done you know, great stuff in terms of grassland management or hedgerow planting to kind of go, look, look what I've done. You can do that. You can do that, too. It's entirely replicable. But the other side of that is, of course, is that farmers need um, support uh, financially uh, to do that, and not just to implement those changes, but also to um, continue to manage those those kind of those uh, changes that, changes that they've made. For example, woodland planting and so forth. I'll let someone else come in now. Thank you, Jenny. Um, well, yes, I mean, some of these points uh, uh, have obviously been raised, uh, and I think two things that I wanted to add to it in terms of sort of land um, is. As Abby sort of said, you know, if farmers are being um, encouraged to transition to some sort of other farming that perhaps will have a lower environmental impact, there does have to be financial support for that. Um, where will the subsidies go and can actually the subsidies be set so they have that as their main focus going forward? Um, just going back to the issue around planting trees, I think we have to um, also just be mindful of how long it takes trees to grow. 
and particularly if you want some of the broadleaf trees then you know they do take a long time to grow and that I'm sort of what we don't want to do is see the solution now is to plant trees and we don't need to do anything because the trees will sort out the climate emergency for us and I think as we'll see at COP we don't have much time we need to be taking action now and just planting them and waiting for 30 something years etc before we actually really see some benefits of trees then we need to be planting trees I agree but we also need to be looking at changing what we're doing because uh, we don't have the time to sort of say well we'll, we'll wait for that so um, as we're talking about today you know what we're doing in terms of our food what people are eating is something we've got to look at and try and change um, because I don't think we have the time to wait for the trees to grow to a level where you know they are mitigating um, climate change. Thank you and Sarah did you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think I'm not sure if I said we should plant trees. I, I was saying nature based solutions to cover a broad range of possible um, ways forward. And it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be you know, not having the livestock. Um, as, as others have said, you know, you can have a mixture of, of different um, nature based solutions on a farm. But we do still I'm really concerned that we need to have a sense of the scale of this problem, uh, alluding to what Jenny was saying there about the amount of time and the urgency factually you know different animals are not equal indeed but actually you know beef and lamb are causing the largest amounts of greenhouse gas emissions per per gram of product by quite a large margin at the moment and so we need to look at the quantities not necessarily to stop doing some of these things but we are actually going to free up a lot more land as well because they do use more land than the other animals as well so you know, I'm not saying that we sh what the solution should be. I think what it's actually raising is that we need a uh, a conversation which brings in the stakeholders to decide which of these options we're all going to do together, um, but in a quantitative way um, where we can all see, you know, how much different things are going to really have an impact. I think that's a really good point. I mean, speaking to the farmer and the farm that I was on last week, it was about what's the cumulative impact of action as well and, and the different actions that people will take depending on their context. So they, you know, the balance of hedgerow planting and some, some tree planting that they had done was having an impact, as was the way that they were, um, you know, their cattle were being, being raised in terms of their grass consumption and all of those sorts of things. So they wanted to look at it in more of a cumulative way. And I think as a policy, uh, you know, decision maker, I think it's, we need to look at that in the round, certainly. Um, I'm going to move on to audience questions, but Pete, did you want to come in briefly just on, on this? Just say, you know, obviously not all land is equal. You know, on my farm, you can't really grow crops, most of it. You know, it's good for grass, it's good for trees, it's good for grass and trees together. You know, and, and just to remember that, you know, what's swallowing up the best quality land is urban sprawl. You know, it's not, it's only 2% of the world's covered in, in houses and roads at the moment, but it's still often the best land. And so this thing about, Reclaiming some of that for urban farming is also really important because that's where the best land is and often the best climate is. Having served on a planning committee in a local authority in a previous life, I'm going to segue away from that quickly. But I think I think it's a fair point about land use and about local planning, and we need to think about that as well in the round. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, really about how do we move food service and restaurant industries perhaps around when it comes to sustainable food and get them to think differently. Uh, and linked to that, I think the rise of those plant-based and fake meats, if you like, you know, is that about profit margins for uh, biotech multinationals, and does it signal away a uh, move away from perhaps more traditional farming and local markets? You know, is that a problem, and is it a problem, I suppose, for that industry uh, more widely? Um, Abby. So. Um... Yeah, I think there's a range of different things that we can do here. Um, one of the projects we've been working on in Glasgow for the last few years uh, through Glasgow Community Food Network has been the Chef's Challenge. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a little, it's a very much a stunt. It's an event. It's an annual thing, and it, but it's really around raising awareness amongst the um, hospitality sector um, in the city um, around kind of, I guess, what's out there that they can possibly use, and these misconceptions around what we actually produce in Scotland or what, what can be grown in Scotland, for example. Um, so the Chef's Challenge has uh, taken has had taken place every September for the last few years. 
and it's like a competition between 20 different uh, chefs and restaurants to um, to use a, a sort of mystery box of locally sourced vegetables to create a very much a plant-based, veg-based, veg-centred dish. Um, and that gets judged, uh, again, they go through a couple of rounds and the, the, the final three uh, sort of have a bit of a cook-off, which gets judged by um, Gary McLean and Kate Devine, who are both quite well known within the food sector and food writing scene. So I think things like that, that raise awareness, um, chefs like to be competitive. <laughs> but ultimately, there's, um, I guess, you know, my, my work with, with kind of the hospitality sector and food economy and food businesses is that, you know, people want, so those businesses want, um, they want continuity, they need a single point of ordering, um, they can't be faffing about trying to find, you know, courgettes from over here and, you know, broccoli for, and from over there. So, yeah, it, it kind of needs a, a sort of be, you know, better joined up supply chains, um, really, that kind of maximise on what we've got available at the same time as um, as increasing the availability of uh, and, and diversity and range of what we can produce. So it's, it's multiple things, but I think pressure from hospitality sector would be would be very helpful, um, and procurement as well. You know, because that that's that's kind of their big buyers, big buyers of, of large quantities of foods on a regular basis. So uh, we absolutely have to be working with them. Uh, Pete? Just to echo that, we've seen a transformation the last few years in this. We run a project called Peas Please across the UK, which is about trying to change the food environment, help people eat more vegetables. Um, we work with all the multiple retailers, but also all the big catering companies. And catering companies have been bite, biting our hands off, basically, to get into this, because obviously going to plant-based protein is more helpful for them. It reduces their costs increases the margins, but they've also got a genuine commitment to some of this stuff. You speak to the chief executive of Compass UK, absolutely on board with this, and you'll have noticed that Compass at the SEC that are hosting the COP, um, they've gone to 80% Scottish, high welfare, sustainable agriculture, and they're absolutely on it. You know, they are serious about this and reducing their food waste and reducing their packaging. And when you see their menus for the COP, you know, this is completely different from what we would have seen five years ago. So Dex are the same, Baxter story are the same. You know, it's the caterers are moving, the big caterers are moving faster, faster, farther and faster than we'd have expected. But and we will also know, you know, the restaurants in Glasgow have been crying out. We've been getting calls all the time. How do we source more local stuff? Who's the best place we can source from? Where can we get stuff that really shows our far climate credentials? Because we've got the cop and, the, you know, we're seeing more and more and more restaurants, you know, the places, the ordinary places, not the sort of organic places, the vegan places, but the ordinary places being really interested now in actually understanding about sourcing locally and about sourcing sustainably. And I think because the caterers directly put stuff on our plates, that's a really important place to start because they, they do do choice editing for us. Okay, thank you. We're getting some uh, more uh, audience questions in now, and I suppose maybe linked to that, it's about Choice and how 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 can we make choices uh, more easily? You know, a lot of people are, are keen to try and do the right thing, so perhaps more of a flexitarian diet. I think might be the expression that's used, where uh, reducing meat uh, several days a week or not eating meat several days a week um, is certainly something uh, I've tried to do. Um, but, but what are the kind of maybe perhaps the strategies around that, um, or what other there are good ways to do that that are um, easy for people to understand and, and sustainable? Um, Jenny, I know you wanted to come in on the last point as well, so do you maybe want to take this and then I'll come to Vera? Okay. Um, well, I was going to come on the last point because I was going to ask uh, Peter a quick question, uh, which you can maybe come back and answer in a minute, is uh, if everybody's going to source local food, how much local food can we produce? Anyway, so that Pete can maybe answer that in a minute because if every restaurant in the whole of Scotland want to uh, source local food and produce that, is that possible? And if it isn't, what is the next level? But going on to um, the question about what we want, how can we persuade people to do it? I think there's a, a number of things that um, we know from our research that are barriers um, to this. Um, because people perhaps don't think it tastes good, people, it can be more expensive. I mean, if you look at some of the convenience foods, they are more expensive than the meat equivalent. Um, but I think the language we use around this is really important. Um, we call, keep talking about protein replacements, protein alternatives. We don't need more protein in our diet. Vegetarians and vegan eat more protein than they require. Um, and so, 
there's a fear if you talk to people that if they change their diet and don't eat meat, they will become protein deficient. And there's lots of evidence to support that, that that is one of the big barriers that I'll become protein deficient, particularly among men. So the more we talk about protein replacements, the more we're reinforcing that. So I would like to see us talking about alternatives, food alternatives, or something like that, because if we were switching to a plant-based diet, protein is the least of our worries in terms of nutrients. So I think there is a language thing that we need to change here as well to overcome that sort of con health concern people have. Okay, we're gonna come to Sarah and then I'll come back to Pete on that first point. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, some of the things I'm going to say I probably learned from Jenny or reading Jenny's paper. So uh, I think that, you know, it, in terms of the language, um, that it is very much about how you phrase these things. Um, you know, if you if you put on a menu, for example, you know, meat free, whatever, that sort of is quite a negative uh, co co concept. But on the other hand, if you say it as a delicious, you know, whatever, then it, it, it can change the uptake of those things. So there's research uh, showing that that's the case. Um, but also, um, you know, we need to, what we find is that when we talk to people, they do want to change things. And and there's the um, the, the the Civic Charter just coming out today um, with, with, from from Scotland, uh, which has got a, a huge amount of consensus around you know having more on labelling uh, and having more information available. So we can put that information available on the the canteens, for example. Um, and, and that's something that the children in schools as well have been asking us when we've talked to them that they're actually going to start labeling some of their, their foods. So, you know, I think there's a lot to take in uh, every single time we choose what to eat. But still those broad that information and information about the great work that maybe Pete's doing on, on his farm and how that is actually really good. You know, low impact meat, potentially. We want that information to get through to consumers. I'm going to I'm going to come to Pete, but before I do that, we've got another audience question and um, to ask about practical steps to encourage more people to use local veg schemes uh, and move away from supermarkets. So, um, in addition to your comments on this, Abby, I'm going to come to you after Pete's responded, just to, to pose that as well. Um, so, Pete, do you want to respond to some of those comments? Yeah, it's a really good point, Jenny, about about markets and supply and demand. I think it would be fair to say with Compass certainly and Sodexo, they're now talking to pick up Sarah's point about plant forward menus, you know, and that that's the framing they're using with plant forward. They're talking about, you know, seventy five percent of their plate being veg, all these sorts of, you know, changing changing what's normal, changing what people expect, um, putting if there is a choice on the menu, they put the non meat choice at the top of the menu rather than at the bottom menu where it always used to be. So all those things they're really conscious of trying to make a difference there. But I think to find the most interesting if you you know, certainly if you look at the organic stuff in Denmark, you know, to begin with, the organics procurement sucked in imports and then the local market picked up. And to some extent, you know, they send market signals to producers in Scotland to go, actually, do you know what? You could produce more of this and that would be, you know, something that people would buy. So even things like grain legumes, which we can grow in parts of Scotland quite well, you know, fava beans, you know, we don't grow because it's too much of a faff and we don't have a certain market for them. But actually, when you get market signals that people are looking for this stuff, then the markets can change. You know, you, you're always going to have cost production issues in some parts of Scotland for some crops, but I think that and it's not just about local; it's also about sustainable. But I think we will see the caterers probably leading leading the way on some of these procurement practices, and then we need to make sure the public sector caterers are at least as good as private sector caterers. And sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're very, very excellently good, and sometimes actually they're they're buying the cheapest food, and they're not even yeah. You know, the fact that we can't always give away free school meals means that we've got a little way to go in terms of how we're doing our public food. Yeah, and as someone who until recently also served as an education convener in a local authority, I think that's a, a really fair point. And, um, you know, I think our young people, um, the choices aren't always the best for them uh, in catering, and we do need to look at that impact as well. Abby, um, give us your thoughts. Yeah, there's quite a few points to come back on here, isn't there? Um, where to start? So I was thinking, uh, firstly, I was kind of thinking about um, some of Sarah's comments on kind of, I guess, the, the sort of plant-based versus um, meat-based dishes. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is one or the other. I think it comes back to the education, uh, sort of, you know, the root of that again, and kind of looking at the, at the system as a, as a whole. Um, there is, as I said, you know, I think there's this danger of kind of vilifying farmers and kind of going, it's all your fault. 
Um, and we have to think about rural livelihoods here at the same time, you know, and what makes a, a thriving rural community. And um, as Pete said earlier, not all so, not all soils are made equal in the same as the same way as not all animals are made equal. And certainly, some parts of this country are definitely better for for, for raising um, raising livestock on. It could be done in a better way, in a more regenerative way. And I think that's kind of what we need to focus on is kind of um, where we are uh, raising our livestock. We need to make sure that it is done in a, in a in a way that is beneficial for our ecosystems and our environment, and that people know that that's that that that, that meat is available and uh, and know where they can get it if they choose to eat it. Yeah, I, I, I do agree and take the point completely that we need to eat less of it as well. Um, on the production uh, and supply kind of issue, yeah, we don't grow anywhere near enough vegetables uh, in this in this country in Scotland uh, for us to be um, eating these these plant based plates that we that we kind of aspire to. Um, something like along the lines of 185,000 hectares in Scotland is under a barley, wheat, and maize production. Um, and the vast majority of that, if not all of it, is for um, either whiskey and brewing, uh, or for animal feeds, and most of that whiskey is for the export market. Um, and that compares with about 18,000 hectares under vegetable production. Um, and uh, one hectare is about the size of one rubber pitch, just for, for context, uh, for folks that don't know land stuff. <laughs> and, yeah, so yeah, there's a huge disparity around kind of what we produce, what we currently produce, and that, and certainly that needs to change. And there's, uh, you know, I was told when I first moved to Dumfries and Galloway that you can't grow vegetables in Dumfries and Galloway, um, but I've got an acre of, of uh, vegetables just over there. So, um, so it is possible to, 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 you know, to, to build soil and change the way we produce things um, by, by sort of careful management, but. Yeah, it's not it's not the easiest ride, and it, and, it, and again, it comes back to to kind of farmers and food producers being supported to do that, um, not just through peer to peer support, but also through to kind of financial mechanisms, um, and that includes vegetable production because that's a big piece of the jigsaw that's missing from the current Scottish government consultation on the agricultural transition in Scotland. It's they're not really talking about vegetables, as far as I can see. Um, yeah, so that that really needs to come into it, and vegetable producers need to be better supported. Thank you. Um, we're coming into kind of our, our closing minutes. I'll take Jenny just on that point, and then I'm going to kind of pose the final question for us. So, Jenny, um, I'm not looking for an answer to this. I'm just throwing it out there. Is uh, Abby, you mentioned the fact that most of, a huge amount of our land is used for um, the whiskey industry and brewing industry. Um, I'm just wondering how we're going to square that circle going forward. Do we produce we uh, food or whiskey? And what that means for the government in terms of economics, I'm not expecting an answer. It's just a comment. Okay. Thank you very much, and a very relevant one, uh, to be fair as well. Um, I think with COP on the, the very close horizon now, and thinking about I suppose what governments have to do, uh, and indeed what uh, we need to try and uh, push corporations to do more. You know, what are the incentives that might convince um, that industry, those industries that, that, that produce our food, make dramatic changes um, and to, to drive forward the change that I think we would want to see coming out of, of something like COP? That's a massive question. I appreciate it. But um, start with Pete. Yes, I don't want to go to too much policy wonkery here, Paul, but one of the things Scottish Government's doing at COP is presenting the Glasgow Declaration on Food and Climate. And that's a global declaration on integrated food policies and adopting integrated food policies that policies on health, on waste, you know, on environment, on climate to, to tackle climate change. And Scotland's presenting that at COP26 with over 100 cities from all around the world. And that's really sending a very strong message that we need sustainable food systems. Scotland's also bringing forward the Good Food Nation Bill, which fits really well with the EU law that's just coming out on sustainable food systems. So at EU level, we're producing a law on sustainable food systems, and Scotland is very much marching in step with that with its Good Food Nation Bill. And, and I think, you know, what people like Jenny have done over the years on sustainable food, you know, is actually bearing fruit. I think people are making that connection that we, we can have a sustainable food system, but we need policy action, and we need to pull the levers a different way from the way we've been pulling them. And we'll, we'll see an agriculture bill in the next couple of years and there's every hope that we can change the way we invest in farmers, so we really support them to do the right thing. So I think I think there's there's cause for some optimism in here. 
Hey Dan, do you have some thoughts on on COP and what we might want to see in terms of action? I, well, I think that it's really exciting the way that we've got you know this resolution now, this this amount of detail, I should say, on you know what the plans are from various countries, and obviously we're still digesting the. Um, the announcements from from uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago. But uh, you know, I think that what's even more exciting for me is the uh, level of public interest. And what I would love to see is, you know, if we look say back five years um, about plastics, how consumers, citizens are actually driving policies of businesses and governments and supermarkets um, to reduce the amount of plastic they're using. Now, whether you agree with that or not, the fact is that citizens are driving change now. Um, in terms of what you know, policies around food, including plastic packaging, I want to see that same level of enthusiasm and that same shift um, for climate policies around food. So instead of this sort of governments being so frightened of, of announcing new climate policies around food, I want to see the public driving that and politicians and and um, in Scotland responding to that. And, and the, you know the, the audience question there is about I suppose incentives. You know, is it about um, carrot or stick? I wonder. Are we are we in that space where we want to talk about you know from the point of view of uh, legislation? And you know, Jenny, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think uh, as Sarah says, you know, we do need to sort of do something to incentivise whether or not it's coming from citizens pushing it or from sort of industry helping it and I think we do need both sides um, and I think we are going to have incentives we've talked about farmers and if we're talking about reducing our meat consumption how are we going to help farmers transition to something else how are we going to make sure that um, industry what happens within that process um, can also make the environmental changes that are needed sort of in the production side um, and so I think we do need some political support um, at all stages of the food system. But exactly as Pete says, is it's got to be joined up. We need to bring all the departments together. So if we're talking about taxing a particular type of food, that the health and environment sectors are speaking about this together. So again, you've got this greater movement behind it rather than one department talking about it and maybe not quite joining up with the other. Um, going back to COP, um, I really hope that food is high on the agenda of this, because if we look at global food secure insecurity, what's down the line for us? If we're not talking about food within the COP, it's going to be a huge disappointment. Thanks, Jenny. And I'm sure everyone here will be watching uh, Glasgow very, very closely uh, over the, the, the coming weeks of COP. Um, particularly, I think absolutely food and sustainability has to die at the heart of that. And indeed, that invitation I was talking about to a farm came off the back of wanting to share what's going on in farms ahead of COP. And it was uh, one of the first times as a politician I've, I've went and actually been invited to visit. So it's already opening up, I think, doors that should have perhaps been open, or, or, or gates rather, shall we say, that perhaps should have been opened a long time ago. Can I thank our audience for their contributions uh, today? And before we close our event, I think it's important maybe just to hear a final word from each of our panellists uh, on this topic uh, and on what they've heard so far. So I will ask um, each panellist just to take about a minute, if they can, to, to give us their concluding remarks. And I'm going to start with uh, Abby, and then I'm going to go to Pete, and then Jenny and Sarah in that order. So, so Abby, over to you. Yeah, so I think you know everything I do within my work um, is trying trying to sort of build a, a sort of collaborative movement. If we're talking about a citizen-led and people-led movements, and I think it's really important that our our food systems change uh, is very much people-led and citizen-led, um, and that everybody everybody we aspire to a, a, a sort of future where everybody has equal access to affordable, good, healthy food. Um, we aspire for a future where our food has been ecologically produced in a way that is beneficial for biodiversity for, and for our ecosystems, um, and to a, a future where everybody working within the, those food systems has um, is respected and, and paid a fair wage. Um, 
I don't think that's too much to ask for. <laughs> but rooted within that, I think at the at the root of that anyway is, as I keep coming back to, food education um, in, a, in a myriad of ways, both through connecting people where their food comes from, understanding how food is produced both here and elsewhere in the world. Um, yeah, and, and, and building that citizen-led movement, that food sovereignty movement uh, that can help achieve pe people-led uh, food systems change. I think it's so it's so important. It needs to, it needs to be a, a very a true collaborative approach, not top-down, not corporation-led, a, a, a collaborative approach that involves everybody. Thanks, Abby. Pete? Yeah, thanks. We spent most of human history not having enough food, not being able to use enough food um, in the last 30 years that's changed and we haven't come to terms with the fact that production is not the main problem but nourishing people and not screwing up the planet is now the main problem and what we need to do is to realign the food system purpose as Abby talked about what is it we're trying to do here because it's not producing more we're trying to realign that with with nourishment and that means ensuring access to a healthy sustainable diet for everybody everybody in Scotland everybody in the UK everybody globally and therefore we need business models for farmers and for food businesses that work to that new paradigm. And that means leveling the playing field with things like taxes on methane, taxes on nitrogen, which means that those operators need to now work in a new world, but it's on a level playing field. So we need to create those sorts of different rules of the game so that the farmers, the food businesses can actually realign what they do with nourishing people and looking after the planet. That's the goal. Thank you. Jenny? Well, coming back to the title of this uh, Cutting Your uh, Food's Carbon Footprint, um, I think we need to be aware the evidence shows that we're not going to achieve the reduction in emissions we need just by the production system. We can only achieve it if people change their diets as well. And uh, so we've got a big challenge here in changing people's diet, and we can't under underestimate how hard this is going to be, but we really need to sort of think of some innovative ways of doing this. Um, just on another point, if you saw recently uh, published that meat consumption is going down in um, most parts of the population, but amongst young people, it's slightly increasing, which is interesting that um, it's a sector of the population that we assume is more signed up to um, carbon issues, wanting to make a change, but there's obviously some resistance still there and we've got to look at how we can overcome this. And the only way we can really do this is to have a proper joined up approach. You know, what is happening within the whole food system that is uh, driving some of these things? So we, we have to take a full food system approach to this. And that's a global approach, not just within Scotland. Thank you very much. And Sheila. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do need to change what we're eating and what we're producing. And I think that we need to do that in a way that involves uh, the stakeholders in the system. So not just the citizens, um, but also the farmers. We need to have this, this joined up conversation with the quantitative information available. And even though maybe young people maybe are, 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 are as Jenny said, they are increasing their meat consumption, they're actually also sometimes more aware and more interested in changing their diets, motivated by climate change than maybe older generations. So I think we need these two steps. One is education uh, to raise the importance of, of food climate policies. Then we need to have the, the policies themselves being brought in in a way that brings everyone together into that conversation, um, motivated by the demand for those policies. So I think we need to do all of those things in one go. Thank you very much. Um, we must end there. We're just coming on for four o'clock. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and for making such a big contribution to our discussion. And thank you to our panel I brought to you in partnership with the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen. So can I thank Professor um, Sarah Bridle, Professor uh, Jenny McDermott, Abby Morden and Pete Ritchie for giving up your time and taking part in the Festival of Politics. Um, I also have a few plugs to do before we all go. Um, just to remind everyone that um, there's a discussion on the very topical issue of male violence against women at 5 p.m. today. And then over the next few days, we'll be discussing everything from fast fashion to climate action, diversity in politics, radical solutions to poverty and resilient cities. And indeed, I see a message there about should, should we stop eating fish, I think, is one of the sessions as well. So all very topical and all very interesting. And I do hope that you can join more of these discussions as we go forward. Thank you very much uh, and take care.